In the name of God, amen. Please be seated. On August 2nd, 1957, three people entered the Barber County Courthouse in Eufula, Alabama to register to vote. They were given an oral test, challenging by any standards, which they were compelled to take together. One woman, Margaret Frost, had studied hard for the test because she had failed it once before. For months, she had, quizzed, she had her husband quiz her on the questions that the Board of Registrars might ask until she was confident that she could answer every one. On August 2nd, she put on her best clothes and went to the courthouse again. She answered all the questions put to her correctly but another in her group did not. As a result, all three were sent home to study a little bit more. The Board of Registrars felt free to treat them in that way because of the color of their skin. The degree of courage required of Southern African Americans to attempt to vote in 1957 is difficult to fathom. Even when physical intimidation wasn't used to discourage them, as it often was, stories abounded of blacks who registered and shortly thereafter lost their jobs, or if they were farmers, they were told the following spring that they, the bank would not give them the customary crop loan to buy seed. Race relations in the early and mid 20th century South were complicated and at times surprisingly intimate, but they depended upon African Americans accepting their place. Registering to vote was a clear signal that an African American was challenging his or her place. And if in 1957, a black American denied the right to vote, were to ask a lawyer to assist him or her in a legal challenge, that person would discover that there was no legal recourse. This, despite the 15th Amendment to the Constitution that supposedly guaranteed that right, because in the 11 Southern states, there was no specific law to give the amendment force nor were there federal laws to compel the southern states to act. There had been many efforts to pass such laws in the United States Congress without success, which meant that in places like Barber County, Alabama, which had equal numbers of white and black citizens, only 200 black Americans had the right to vote, while 6,521 white Americans enjoyed that right. And of those who had the right to vote, most blacks didn't dare cast ballots for fear of violence or economic retaliation. Now, what never ceases to amaze me when I read our history isn't so much anymore the blatant oppression and petty cruelty of the southern states, which is now a familiar, sad story in the long struggle for civil rights. But what gets me every time is the courage of those who dared to stand up for themselves at a time when the risks were so high. 200 black men and women in Barber County, Alabama, insisted on their right to vote, even if they risked losing their jobs and their farms. And across the South, one in five black citizens were registered to vote. That meant that 1,200,000 people acted with great courage and little hope that the risks they were taking would change the segregation laws that they despised. I ask you, how did the Margaret Frosts of the world keep going? Believing in the dream of racial equality when the reality of racism remains so deeply entrenched in the social and legal fabric of this country. 
Today, we honor and celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the one whose vision for racial equality defined his life and his generation. The haunting words from the book of Genesis that we read today are in his honor. Come now, let us kill the dreamer, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. These words are etched in stone outside the Lorraine Hotel, the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, where King was assassinated, which is now the site of the National Civil Rights Museum. In light of rising racial tensions in our day, a rising up of a new generation of African Americans compelling us all to acknowledge what we should have paid attention to for decades, a persistent and growing racial disparity in the criminal justice system, in opportunities for economic advancement, and all the significant metrics of well-being in this country. It's a good thing to remember what was required of the generations before us in their struggle for justice. 1957. The year Margaret Frost was again denied her right to vote was a tough year for Martin Luther King. He wasn't yet 30 years old, but he had already known the heady euphoria of victory and the bitter discouragement of public failure. Two years before, he had successfully led the Montgomery bus boycott, which resulted in the desegregation of the Montgomery transit system. His eloquence capitulated him onto the national scene where he found himself deluged with speaking invitations. And he hoped that his words, his powerful words, might fuel a national conversion. But no matter how many cities he visited, no matter how the many the cheers and the tear-streaked faces of the people who heard him speak, Segregation remained firmly in place, and he grew discouraged as he realized that eloquence wasn't enough. King needed political power, the kind that only comes through gritty organizing. So he tried to amplify his message through the mass media of his day. He signed a book contract. He, he took cues from the evangelist, Billy Graham, and tried to organize large-scale revival-like events across the South. Yet he was continually dogged by internal conflicts among black leaders and harassment from Southern white politicians. In 1958, a crazed white woman stabbed and almost killed him with a letter opener. In 1959, disheartened with America, King began traveling the world, first to Africa, then to India, in search of both affirmation and inspiration. And when he returned, he made a key decision to resign from his pastorate at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, and he moved to Atlanta to work full-time as the head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. This was a more troubled time for King at his stage in his life than most people around him could ever have known. Failure and a relatively long stretch of casting about without clarity, however, gave him a kind of resilience that success never could. He knew that he was a gifted man, but that his gifts were not enough. He still carried within him the torch of hope, but inside himself he was painfully aware of his own limitations. And he learned, he learned as a young man to persevere in times of struggle, a lesson that would serve him well. Inspiration would come again quickly for King, but it didn't come to him at first. It came first to four college freshmen in Greensboro, North Carolina, who went down to the local Woolworth lunch counter and asked to be served. There had been other sit-ins before, 
But for some reason, theirs was the one to catch fire. The next night, eight students joined them, and the next day, the number had swelled to 85. Word of their action spread to other campuses, quickly crossing over the proverbial tipping point, and the mass movement king had exhausted himself to create happened almost overnight. With humility born of failure, King embraced the student leaders, let them lead, and offered them his full support. And the next chapter in the civil rights history began. And inspiring as the quickening pace of events of the student sit-ins are, still what moves me now is King's steady perseverance when the road before him was not clear, when he realized his preaching skills alone would not transform the country. And what did he do? He did what we all can do in such times. He kept on working. He kept on praying. He changed course more than once. He learned new skills. He formed new alliances. A part of him, part of him was always looking for the spark of the spirit, a spark of inspiration. So when it came, through the idealism and dedication of those students, he was ready to act. Such is the path of social transformation. It's never easy. For every step forward, there's always a setback. There are some who believe that we as Christians shouldn't put ourselves out there in the work of justice, particularly in the early, messy, unclear stages, because of the inevitable tension it creates among us in our communities and the certain failures that we will endure. But while it is easier, it is safer to step back, it would be an abdication of the noble work that God has set before us. It would be a betrayal of all who went before us, fighting for the truths we now take as self-evident, but they fought for with their lives. As my teacher used to say, ships are always safer in the harbor, but that's not what ships are for. This week, this week, a meeting of Anglican leaders from around the world, known as the Anglican Primates, shone a spotlight on the Episcopal Church. And the decisions we made at our general convention last summer regarding the nature of Christian marriage as a sacrament available for all Christians, regardless of sexual orientation. We did not make that decision lightly. It was the fruit of over 40 years of deep conversation, study, and biblical reflection. In the words of our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, our commitment to be an inclusive church is based on our belief that the outstretched arms of Jesus on the cross are a sign of the very love of God reaching out to us all. While we understand that some disagree with us, our decision regarding marriage is based on our conviction that the words of the Apostle Paul to the Galatians are as true for the church today. In Christ, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. All are one in Christ. The majority of the Anglican primates, who are the head bishops of their countries, disagree with us and have decided to sanction the Episcopal Church, limiting our participation in certain bodies of the Anglican Communion. The sanctions imposed will not cause the Episcopal Church to change course 
on our position regarding the full inclusion of gay, lesbian, and transgender people in our church. While not all Episcopalians agree with that position, it nonetheless reflects a broad, deep consensus, as strong and steady as our position of of, on the role of women in church leadership and the full inclusion of divorced persons to other points of difference between us and others in the communion. It is as deeply rooted in us as our, and, and in our identity as our centuries-long struggle for full racial equality in our church and society, still very much a work in progress. We are all a work in progress. God is not finished with us. God is not finished with our church. I deeply regret the pain and confusion the primate's decision has caused members of the Episcopal Church, and particularly our beloved gay, lesbian, and transgender brothers and sisters. But you need not worry about your place in the church. You are welcome here. Your families are welcome here. Your children are welcome here. Where our prayers are most needed today are elsewhere in the world. For vulnerable gay, lesbian, and transgender people for whom the primate's actions, despite their words condemning homophobia, may have a chilling impact. I've been asked by several in the British press if we feel less a part of the Anglican communion because of the primate's action. And this is what I've said, and I ask you to take this to heart Remembering the words and witness of Jesus, and in particular the gospel passage read for today, remembering the witness of Dr. King. The Anglican communion is not determined by hierarchy. It is defined by an extraordinary network of deep and profound relationships across the world based in a common mission. And you should never underestimate how deeply Episcopalian Christians feel in relationship to our brothers and sisters across the world. We accept there are, there are consequences in governance for our decision, but our commitment is with our brothers and sisters, people of faith, striving to ensure that every child in this world does not go to bed hungry, ensuring that we find an end to the AIDS epidemic that, that, that scours this world, ensuring that we find ways for all of God's children to know how beloved they are. And as our presiding bishop has said, we feel it's our vocation. It is our vocation to stay in relationship, but to be clear about the truths which God have, has revealed to us. We are confident that we will be known by our fruits, because we are called to live in this world and to do our part, to do our part to, trans, to transform hope into lived reality. And this is, this is hard work. For every step forward, there's a step back. And we will often come up against, not only from resistance from without, but limitations from within. But the lessons of humility and resilience and perseverance deepen us. They change us. They make us worthy instruments of grace. So I ask you this week to join me in giving thanks for the opportunity to witness to the faith within us and join with me in recommitting ourselves in faithfulness to Jesus in memory of Dr. King to the dream of justice for all of God's children, regardless of the color of our skin, where we are born, or the people that we love. Amen.